Welcome to Forever Marriage and welcome to Lakewood. This is our home church. This is Scott and I, our home church. Um, so we're just happy to have you in our house with us. And I love it that you're around tables because people in our house around tables is one of our very favorite things. Mm -hmm. And you'll get to hear a little bit more about that uh, from us as time goes on because that's really our heartbeat is to be around tables. Um, yes, Scott and I have been married for 30 years. We're as shocked as anybody. <laughs> yeah. We went to Helen on our honeymoon, which is Hey, just out of curiosity, so did anybody besides us go to Helen on your honeymoon? Nobody. Nobody? Oh, somebody. Where? where, where? Somebody? Who is that? Who is that? Chet Cooper. Oh, and and what, what year was that? I guarantee it was in the 80s. 86. I knew it. I knew it. Here's the reality, guys. In the 80s. Chet, where are you from? Are you from here? Stockbridge, down near Atlanta. Okay, that makes sense. So it's south of here. Here's the reality. Growing up, well, when we got married, we, we married in, in, woo, we're picking up big. We got married in um, 87. Yeah. And in the 80s, just like Chet and his bride, when you got married, we were in South Georgia down in Statesboro, and people who got married in the 80s, when I do, we do premarital counseling with people, they get, go to Turks and Caicos, they go to Cancun, they go to all these fancy places that they never go back to. Right. But Dawn and I, the beauty of Helen, baby, we 45 just... minutes, we go up there. <laughs> December 19th, we can go there, Paul's Steakhouse. Chet, did y'all go to Paul's Steakhouse? No? You should. You should. <laughs> You're cheap, man. You're cheap. I was a big spender. We went to Paul's. No kidding. No kidding. 30 years. This is about year 27, I think. About three years ago, we were, <laughs> we were sitting in our booth. We, we were sitting in our booth. She had given us our little... Uh, our little gift. Our little gift, which was... Uh, Paul's Steakhouse seasoning in a container yeah, with a sticky bow seasoning. on yeah, top. Yeah, We're sitting here just loving life. We're looking up at the picture of Merle Haggard right here, smoking a cigarette right above us. And, man, we were just classy. That's right. We, we were. We were classy. Because going to Helen in the 80s, for me, I really thought I was going somewhere. That ought to tell you the small town that I came from. Yeah. It's really small. <clears throat> but we, let, we, we have made it um, 30 years, and it's very surprising that Man, we've made it for 30 years. Let's boom. make it for 30 more. Yeah, let's do it. Um, we do have three children. Our oldest, Hannah, is 28. She is a donor manager, um, donor relations manager at Clemson University, so mm -hmm. we're officially big Clemson fans right now for yeah. her. Uh, we think Hannah can run the world if she gets an opportunity to. She's that capable. We've decided she'll be the one to take care of us when we get old. We've yeah. put that in the will. She'll remember to give us our medications yeah. on time, every That's day. Right. That's right. So she, she's not only the oldest, she is the most capable. Reese is our son. He's in the middle. And uh, he's at home now um, trying out this coaching and teaching uh, profession. So he's trying that on for a size. And Reese, Reese has always been... A leader uh, the question has always been what would he lead people to do mm -hmm. because uh, there were times yeah. where he led people to do you know some questionable things but <laughs> what I'm happy to say and we'll share that story with you privately at some point yeah, when if, when you have publicly. a second grader that gets suspended from school come talk to me because yeah, we had a first right. we had a first grader who got yeah. suspended from school yeah so for leading poorly but Reese is growing this this year he's been man-sized since he was in the eighth grade but I will say in the last year he is growing into a man's man That's right. the days are coming when I will be happy to say you follow him because he's following Jesus it's happening in his life Claire is our baby if you were here last year she was um, helping to lead worship um, she's married and is living in Destin Florida and yes we're having a grandson mm -hmm. We're yeah. getting ready to lose our minds and our money. Yeah. We're excited about it. And every grandparent looks at us the same way, like we're about to get on this ride that not even Disney World can dream up, mm -hmm. right? So exciting about that. One, one day I'm in the hallway, and many of you know Dr. Jerry Gill, who has been on staff with us as our staff counselor for a long time, and he retired, but he still roams these halls a lot. 
So he saw me one day in the hallway, and he said, I hear you're going to be grandparents. And I said, we are, Dr. Gill. I'm so excited. He said, well, are you getting ready for healthy grandparenting? And I thought, you know, gosh, I hadn't thought about it. Dr. Gill is known for his wisdom, so I, I start to lean in. I'm like, no, Dr. Gill, I, I mean, I want to be, so I need to come learn from you and Miss Gail. I'm getting ready for us to go have dinner with him to hear all that. He said, well, here's the best advice I can give you. You just remove the word no from your vocabulary. <laughs> I said, done. I mean, done. Check and check. We're done. <laughs> so we're excited to be with you today, and I feel like, I feel like the Lord has given us a message for you. Yeah. And I pray that we'll be able to lay it down for you. That's really what I've been praying. That God will help us both just be able to lay it out all the way from tonight all the way through in the morning. So I'm just going to ask you, if you've been in one of our Sunday school classes, you know how we run things. We kind of teach a little bit and then we'll have some table talk discussion. So we're going to run this like one giant Sunday school class if you're okay with that. That's all we, that's how we know how to do things. Okay. You, have, um, you have a booklet on your table to take notes in. So we want you to grab that and a pen um, and, uh, and get comfortable with your table because we'll be doing some talking with them in just a little bit. Yeah. So I want us to pray together yeah. and then, um, then we're going to jump off into yeah. it. Heavenly Father, we love you so much and are just grateful for this opportunity to be with all of these who are gathered into this room. And so right now, Lord, I pray that you will help Scott and me be able to lay down what you have been speaking to us. And I pray for that right now we'll take a moment and just turn over the soil in our heart to make it ready to receive whatever it is that you would have for us. So I want to give us just a minute to do that. Just ask the Lord to turn over the soil in our hearts just to make us ready. And we know, Holy Spirit, you are faithful to your work. Yeah. And so we know, Lord, that, um, that you are making their hearts ready even as we speak. So we give you this time in Jesus' yes. name. Amen. Amen. So the theme of this weekend is Better Together, and we're going to kind of start with a big picture that not only are we just better together, but we're better together with God. And I want us to kind of look at the first point together, that together we testify to the grace and to the goodness of God. Together we testify to the grace and the goodness of God. James 1.17 says, Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Marriage is a gift to us overall. Marriage is a gift to us. But we can't really understand this until we go back and take a look at the first marriage in Genesis and how it came about. God is love. We know that from 1 John. He is love, and he created out of that love. The very first Bible verse of Scripture, we could probably all say it together, is John 3.16. For God, what? So loved. He so loved the world. Now, if you, that verse in its, in, in its whole setting, if you read it, it would make you think that God so loved the world on Christmas Eve, he sent Jesus, right? That it's in that space in time. He loved, so loved the world. But we have to know that God is above time and that Jesus was, and this plan for Christ was at the very beginning before the very first words, let there be light, was even spoken. God so loved this world. Out of that big heart of love, he created, he made this world. God created Adam and Eve just like that. He made them um, out of that love. And he created them to be lovers, right? When he breathed his spirit into them, when he breathed life into them, he also had created them with these big hearts that could love with a great capacity to love and to be loved. And he poured his love into Adam and Eve so that together at the core of their marriage and their union with God was God's love. It was a powerful core 
for that garden, a powerful core to launch out into the world. God made them, could have made them just co-laborers, you know, just putting two buddies together, mm -hmm. two roommates to make things happen. But he didn't. He gifted them with this powerful, unique relationship called marriage. And he put his love at the very center of it. And I think that this is why the scriptures say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and together they shall be one flesh. Because you cannot have that kind of relationship with your parents. You're not supposed to have that kind of relationship with your parents. You're supposed to leave that because there is a love that can only be experienced, a mixture of this passion and purpose that can only be experienced by this union of husband and wife and the father. They are better when they are joined together, just in that way. He made them to be lovers and workers together. And he made them to experience that love, body, soul, and spirit. A completely unique relationship set in this beautiful garden on planet Earth. And he looked at Adam and Eve and everything that he had created, and he said, this is very good. Marriage is simply confirming and reflecting back that goodness. Mm -hmm. Marriage is simply confirming and reflecting back that goodness, and it testifies to the graciousness of God that he would gift to humanity this relationship, this very unique relationship for us to live and work in and to enjoy. We testify, marriage testifies to this very good idea, this very good thing, that God has gifted to the world. So after we understand it is a good gift from God and we testify about his goodness, we have to open our hearts and our minds to the purposes for marriage. So this is big picture stuff. We testify to his goodness and greatness and we open our hearts and minds to God's purpose for marriage. So the Lord took the man, according to Genesis 2.15, took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it. And God made a lover slash helper in Eve to come alongside him to fulfill that mission, to do it together. At the core of marriage is God's love, the love of God. And from that core comes the mission of marriage, and that is fruitfulness 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 is the mark of a healthy marriage it is it's the mark of a healthy marriage and is powerful enough to affect change in the whole earth apparently Adam and Eve were the only ones there at the time but God casts in front of them this huge and compelling vision that said I want you to be fruitful I want you to multiply I want you to fill the whole earth this core of love, this powerful thing, this union of those three, the covenant relationship of marriage was that powerful enough to affect change in the whole world. That's huge. That purpose of drawing them together. And the fellowship with him was meant to be a foundation of sorts that God would build mankind on. I mean, that's really big when you think about it. It was meant to add stability to creation and they creation itself were unknowingly depending on Adam and Eve to fill that mission you think about that they were unknowingly creations going about doing their creation thing it's not like they got together the animals and said hey you know we might need a plan B in case this doesn't work out here for us we're gonna have to learn how to take care of ourselves that's not the case creation unknowingly depending on Adam and Eve to accept their mission and to complete and fulfill their mission. Likewise, marriage, because the principles of the garden haven't changed. Uh, we know some things from the garden have changed, but the principles from there have not changed. Marriage also is meant to add stability. It's meant to bring stability to our homes. It's meant to bring stability to our church. And it's meant to bring stability to our community. And there are... All those people in those environments are unknowingly depending on us 
to accept the mission and fulfill the mission that we said yes to mm -hmm. on December the 19th, 1987. Mm -hmm. They're not sitting around and you're not sitting around going at night going, ooh, 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 I need, we need a plan B in case Scott and Dawn happen to not work out in their marriage. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about that really. But they're depending on us to fulfill that vision. We know that's how it was supposed to be. But if you've been married for any length of time, you know that's not how it is. Some of you are feeling like when you've come in here, and we know it. Scott and I have done lots of marriage conferences before. We've been to lots of marriage conferences before. We've been in great shape when we've been to marriage conferences, and then we have been in the darkest places when we've gone to marriage conferences. So we know that some of you might hear that word gift, and you are feeling like, well, yeah, but marriage has felt more like a gag gift to me than anything else. And it's not funny to me anymore. And if there's, been, if there's any fruit now coming out of our life, it's like plastic fruit. I mean, it's pretty. We, we got it looking good, but it's not real. If you look on my social media page, all my children look like they've been carved out of cream cheese. Everything looks great in my house, but in reality, it's not. It's like plastic fruit. It's not good for anything except to make a nice appearance. It destabilizes. So what happened? We have to go back to the story. You know, it only took one good question for the serpent to destabilize Adam and Eve. One finely crafted question, did God really say in order to destabilize Adam and Eve? And rather than reach for the father because they were better together with him, they reached for the forbidden fruit, mm -hmm. and they pulled it into them. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they knew immediately that something was wrong with them, that something had changed in their relationship, right? The Bible says their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked and ashamed, right? Their, immediately, they knew something was wrong with them and in their relationship. But what they didn't know and what they couldn't have known until they stepped outside of the garden is that that one decision that they had made in containment had gotten out of containment. It had gone viral and it affected everything. That all of creation now that had been depending on them, they were innocent in this whole equation, were now subjected and were having to pay a price now for that one decision that they had made together. Not only did it affect it, life far-reaching outside of the garden, but it affected them very close to home. Because it wasn't long after that that God came and brought to them the skin of an animal. And I wonder what kind of impact that might have had on Adam and Eve. If they knew that skin. Some of, some of you have animals, and you would recognize that skin. And I wonder if they did. I wonder if they knew that this was not just a covering, but this will be a reminder to them that there is a high price that will be paid, that there are unintended consequences for sin, and that some in our lives are going to pay a higher price than others when we do. Now, Scott and I know this pretty intimately. We met in our own little Garden of Eden, which we call the 1980s, right? Yeah, this is, uh, I think we've got a picture of this. Uh, when, uh, yeah, oh man, I look very drunk in that picture, but I, I promise I wasn't. Uh, here's, the, here's the thing about Dom that you need to know about Dom. This is, this, this very outfit, guys, when y'all hear us talk about that purple jumpsuit and the white bowling shoes, this is the outfit. Yeah. Here, here's the story of, of, of us. We met in, uh, in September of 86, and we married in December of 87 there was something about dawn garrett that just kind of caught caught my eye she worked that purple jumpsuit that that permed hair those white bowling shoes like nobody's business she uh she worked at a at a hallmark store there in in statesboro mall the hen house is, was the name of it my mom at the time was working at jc penny's and i would take my mom to work and I would just kind of, I often would take my mom to work because I needed a car. I was still in college and I was still bumming off my mom and dad. I needed a car, but I really just wanted to go see Dawn. 
because Dawn would walk through the hallways of, of the, that, in that purple jumpsuit and those white shoes. And I'm telling you, there was just this air of confidence about her that she, uh, she just exuded this, this feeling like I could take you or leave you. And I'm telling you, I'm like, girl, I'm going to take you. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to win you. So we go to the next picture, which is, you know, we had, we had, I had won her over. I think the next, there it is. Yeah. So back that time, man, that was pounds ago. I had that nice little stash there that you worked back in the eighties. I'm not really sure what that was. Hey, if you can't tell in this picture though, this was back in the, this was White Snake days, all the big hair bands. Everybody had a perm. Males had a perm, females had a perm, everybody had a perm. I had the receding hairline, it's all receded now. But back there, that was a perm in the back of that. You can't tell. It was a perm mullet. It's kind of grown out. A perm mullet in the back. It was kind of business in the front, party in the back. Dawn had, y'all don't remember, how many of you remember the shoulder pads in the shirts? But they were yeah. removable. They were Who's removable. with me on that? You could hey. take them out and wear them in different Oh, shirts. that's right. Remember I coached that? one year. This was in the 88, yes. I think. Dawn played on my softball team. We would, we, I coached our church league girls softball team, and we had a girl named Valerie that had her church league jersey on, and she would shoulder put shoulder pads. pads in her jersey before the softball game because that was just the style. So we both had these perms. We're working the pretzels there, which leads us to the next picture. But what you can't see in this okay. picture, which we'll get to this one. This yeah. is, yes, we'll, we got a lot to say about that one. Yeah, that's, there's a is lot going Scott's on. Is that Scott's had on jams. How many of you remember what uh, yeah, jams yeah. are? Yeah. J you need to Google jams because they were the thing. Jams I see you, were Jane Weaver. Jane knows what jams are. Yeah. That's right. They were awesome. Oh, I'm, that I'm thing they're making awesome a comeback. because here's how I work and my if, jams. Uh, yeah. Yeah, here's how I work my jams. Jams were like the Hawaiian shorts that came down to here, and you wore like dock siders or some kind of shoes with no socks, and they always smelled really bad after you took them off at night. And I, I would have to open my dorm window and stick, stick my shoes in the window because they would just smell up the dorm if I, if I didn't. But I wore my jams and a wife beater t-shirt, and it was come, sometimes it was a, like a... a a faded like a kind of aqua color. Aqua blue. Aqua blue, yeah. It didn't really have to match. Very and Miami And then in Vice. the wintertime, I had my jams, my wife beater t-shirt, and my denim jacket. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's so. amazing. But yeah, don't. This was yeah. our engagement photo. Yeah. Stay so whenever hair. whenever we look, on, we, whenever we see all of your engagement photos where you're running around in a field and you collapse on a couch and all of that's out there, I want you to know that's not real. That's this not is real. real. This is real. Right? <laughs> this is real. This is Statesboro Herald. They just put you in front of this blank sheet on the wall, and you stand here like this, and that's, that's your engagement that's photo. That's right. It ain't any of that corny stuff in the field running with the horses. By. No. No, that's not. This, this is, is real. real there, there is no filter that's going to make that better. It no. just is what it is. Yeah. Both of us... Scott in his mullet, me in my Amish church frock. Yeah, I don't, you, I'm not exactly you, sure what that you is. You were rocking it, baby. Right? <laughs> we were so in love, Helen, those kids. Helen, here we come. Helen, here, here we, we come. come. Yeah. Right? We started dating in March of 87, um, and then we were married in December. It was very fast and furious. Um, we were head over heels in love with each other. Um, in, I went to talk to my own father in July about marrying Scott, and he told me, no, you can't marry him. Hey, here's the crazy story I just remembered, honey. Okay. It, we were, I was coming back from mom and dad's. They lived in Hawassi at the time, going back to Statesboro. And I don't know why, but I came through Gainesville, Georgia. This was, this was 1980. This was June of 87. I was going for some reason, didn't know what Gainesville, Georgia was at the time. This was 87. Driving down Browns Bridge when the Walmart used to be over there on Browns Bridge. Y'all remember that? Remember that? This is before cell phones. So y'all, that this, is, this predates. This is when if you had to make a call while on the road, you had to stop and call a, a, a actual coin phone. So I, Jonathan, I stopped at the Walmart there on Browns Bridge. I called Dawn because I knew she was going to talk to her, her dad, and this is what I heard. And he said no, and I bawled my eyes out you on the cried. phone. Daddy's you not going to let us get married. It was very upsetting. He said, you don't know, Scott. And I thought, but yes, I do. We're so compatible. <laughs> We're, you know, all of the things that you hear, right? 
Well, we decided we could wait the summer, and so we waited the summer, and in August I was moving into an apartment with another girl, and my parents came down to, um, to visit us in Statesboro That's to help right. us move. And as we were sitting in the living room, Daddy, I remember, had a fly swatter, and he was yeah. spinning that fly swatter on his finger. And Scott said, Mr. Charles, we want to talk to you about getting married. <laughs> I had a lump in my throat the size of Texas, and because uh, I, I love my daddy. I mean, I am a daddy's girl, and uh, I, I just could tell on his face, uh, he was say, his mouth was saying yes, but his heart was saying, this is never going to work. And he said, if this is what you want to do, then mm -hmm. I, I will give you our blessing to do it. So that was in August. Um, that was on a Saturday night. That Sunday morning, the next morning, mm -hmm. Scott and I were singing a special in our church. Special music. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you remember what special music yeah. is in the service. It's a song that right, right before the offering. Right before the or offering. During the or offering, during the offering. While the That's offering's right. being taken yep. out. Yeah. And um, in our little church at Fletcher Memorial Baptist Church, it had orange carpet, and mm -hmm. we had blue choir robes. Yeah. And so we baby were blue, baby, baby blue, blue choir robes. Choir robes. So yeah. uh, Scott, Teresa Gassett, and myself were standing up there in our blue choir robes. That had The house was full of 250 people including my parents and his yeah. parents. Yeah. And so as Teresa exited off, and I'm getting ready to, Scott said, I need you to stay right here for just a minute. And so he got on his knees right there and pulled a ring out of his blue choir robe and proposed to me. And I should have known right there that our <laughs> life was going to be lived out in front of people, yeah. that anything that happened in the, in our, in the Smith house was going to be talked about. It was going to be the point of the Sunday school lesson. It was going to be lived out in public. It's because practical it had, illustration, I, I, you got to give people I, I something understand. to relate to. Yeah, yeah. well, mm -hmm. I, and I understand that. But yeah. I should have, I would have said, mm, probably not. If, yeah, but but I, there's no way I was going to do that. I was a, I was a fool in love, mm -hmm. a young fool in love. Love is blind, but marriage is an eye open. Yes. Yeah. Somebody said, mm -hmm. if you, you know, you, you need to walk into marriage with your eyes wide open. Once you get inside marriage, you need to squint a little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree with that. I think that's good advice. So we got married in December, planned us a, a, um, a big wedding reception in the basement of First Baptist Church with cocktail weenies and, oh, yeah. you know, the cheese straws. Cheese and straws, so, man. you know, and that yeah. was it. And we were off to Helen and happiness forever. <laughs> right? <laughs> That lasted about six months. Yeah. And um, what neither Scott or nor I knew that is that you don't get to start at a clean slate at the altar. That you actually bring a lot with you to that moment. And it really has nothing to do with each other. No. That you really already have these very well-established paradigms of how relationships work based on your family of origin and your own relational experiences. And then when you get together, marriage is God's systematic way of dismantling those paradigms to build up the only one that will carry you the distance, and that's found in Scripture. It's, it's, it's that simple and that hard all at the same time. How mm -hmm. many of you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. It was true for us. You know, the, the honeymoon phase wore off very fast. And we were some broken-hearted people before mm -hmm. long. Um, no one would know, have known it because we were very faithful to our church. We were in church every week. Um, Scott became a deacon. Um, I was taking care of the preschool back there. And he was also teaching a class of men who were twice his age. Scott's always been a leader. Um, he just has not always been a great husband, mm -hmm. but I've not always been a great wife. I had no clue and no mentoring on how even to start that journey. So we became the plastic fruit. We were pretty on the outside and people loved us, but when we would get home, we would be miserable and hateful toward each other, very unkind, um, at our, around our you know, not, shortly after our one-year anniversary, I was, got pregnant uh, with Hannah. And when I had her, um, a little piece of my past started to creep up. Um, I was pregnant when I was 15, and I didn't have that baby. I had an abortion, and I didn't tell my parents. So I had a lot of stuff hidden that I had made a determination will stay in my past. Um, God never works that way. It, it, it's like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. Mm -hmm. It's eventually going to bubble up to the surface. And it's going to take a lot of effort. But he's going to, the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, he's faithful to his work. He's not going to make peace with things that don't need to be in your life. And that will harm you. 
So when Hannah was born, I, my heart shattered because I held in my arms for the first time what I had given up a long time ago. And I was a mess on the inside and very broken. And Scott couldn't understand me, and I couldn't understand him, and we just squashed any kind of love that we felt mm -hmm. toward each other. We were hurt and desperate, and both of us laying in the bed at night, backs turned to each other, praying to God. We want out. We know that we're believers. We know that if divorce is really not an option, we'd, we'd said that from the beginning. We know that we're in a church that's going to come knocking on our door. What are you doing if you split up? We had a baby. So getting out wasn't an option, but death was. And so we just began to pray, both of us separately praying, Lord, you can take him out. <laughs> Lord, you, Lord, kill her. Kill her. <laughs> right. Listen, we'll be the grieving person. We, we'll do it, and we'll do it well. We'll, you know, we'll, and I'll tell Hannah. She had a great dad, and he loved her. And, uh, you know, listen. Oh, man, listen. I, I had it all planned out. Listen, it got so bad, guys. I, I would even lay in bed at night. I'm not kidding. This is, this is serious. I would lay in bed at night and fantasize how Dawn might die. I wasn't going to plan. I wasn't going to kill her. I, I wanted to. I wanted the life. I was only 26 years old, but I knew God was the giver of life, and God could take life if He wanted to. And I could. I. I even got to the point. I was bargaining with God. God, I'm even willing to give up my first child here. If Hannah and Dawn are just happen to be in a wreck and it kills them both. I will go to the church at Fletcher, and everybody, no one will know. It'll just be me and you, God. I will go there. I will act like the good, grieving husband. But inside, I'm going to be Martin Luther King, Jr. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And I know that sounds dark and harsh, and it is dark and harsh. The enemy was very close mm -hmm. to us, counseling us about our presence, our present and our future. Yeah. And we were listening because we had so depleted the love that we had at one time for each other. And it was all happening so secretively um, that he was, he was laying down steps that were easy for us to step on. Mm -hmm. And we were stepping on them. There are always unintended consequences to sin. And we were on our way to that. And there are some who are going to pay a higher price than others when we do sin. Scott, and I want to give you some time at the table. You've got some table talk questions. They're going to come up on the screen. I don't know that they're on the screen. Are they no. not? Okay. Well, they should be in your, in your book. We're reading them to them. Oh, we're reading them to <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, we're, we're, neither of us are technology savvy, yeah, so we don't know where they are, but we're yeah. going to tell you what yeah. they are. So the questions for your table are this. What are some of the unintended consequences of sin when we sin? And who in our life would pay the highest price if we fail to complete the mission that we signed up for on our wedding day? And I want you to, now listen, children are an obvious answer. So I want you to think a little bit past that, okay? So your question is, what are some of the unintended consequences of sin, maybe you heard some in our own story, maybe you have some in yours, and then who would pay the highest price if we fail to complete the mission that we agreed to on our wedding day? We're going to give you a few minutes to talk about that, and then we're going to move on to the next point, okay? All right, ready? Go. Go.
Take about one more minute and we'll come back. Okay, so the question that you're talking about at your table are what are some of the unintended consequences when we sin? What, what were some of the things? Y'all can just talk back to us here. What were some of the unintended consequences of our sin that y'all talked about? Guilt? Kids? Trust? Betrayal of trust? Often, yeah. Guilt? Kids, unintended consequences. Um, trust what? Spouse. Is that what you said? Spouse? Yeah. Your testimony. Yes. Yeah. And then some of the people that pay. Who are the people that pay? Dawn said before we started, obviously, children. Someone else. Who else pays? Body of Christ? Yeah. Who else? Family and friends? People that you look up to or people yes. who look up to you? That's right. Yes. That's right. Let me just say this to you. Everyone in this room is leading on some level. Whether you see yourself as a leader or not, you have leadership capabilities, either in the home in the church, in the community, at work. People are watching you, especially since those of you in here, those of us in here who carry the banner of Christ. People are watching us, and they're gauging what is right and what is wrong by what they see from us. And there are unintended consequences. That could be both good and bad on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. When you respond in a way that's patient, that's kind, that's loving, that's generous, when they would think, man, there is no way, there's a consequence there. They see it. It's a positive thing. But we tell our folks here at Lakewood all the time, every one of us, me and Dawn included, every one of us in this room is one dumb decision away from stupid. Every one of us in this room. And if you think you're above stupid, you're more stupid than you think. Anybody who tends to think, oh, I would never do that, that's one of the worst things when we're working with couples that I hate to hear from a spouse say, I would never do that. I'm like, hold it, bro. You're closer to the, to the precipice of falling off than you think when you think you're above it. Here's why we think it's important for you to move through this exercise, and it's a good one for you just to take and think about. Because when you're confined in this secret place like or in this contained place like Adam and Eve or even in your own, when you're contemplating sin, when we're contemplating this wanting to get out and <laughs> hoping that a big truck will come by and run over them in the middle of the night, you know, those types of things, when we're contemplating it, we think a little bit about the, circ about the consequences of it. But we don't often take the time to think about the unintended consequences. That's right. And honestly, in the office, when Scott and I are dealing with couples, this is what we deal with the most. These unintended consequences where people will say, I didn't mean for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. This is not what I meant to happen. Mm -hmm. But it is happening because in the process of you being deceived into sin, the enemy said, you can bear up under whatever happens from here. Anything will be better than what you're experiencing yeah. right now. Yeah. That's what he tells you. What we want you to do is to think about it beforehand. Mm -hmm. I read a book this past year, um, and uh, uh, several of the ladies went through it, called Pursue the Intentional Life by Jeannie Fleming. 
Jeannie put forward this idea of doing some advanced work. She started to think as a 50-year-old woman, what will I be like as an 80-year-old woman? What kind of things might I need to be thinking about now that will help me prepare me for that time when I'm 80 years old? She would read the Bible from that perspective. What will I be like as a widow? What do I need to sort of put in my, to think that, to be ready when widowhood comes for me? And it did a few weeks ago. This idea of advanced work is transforming me. It's making me think about things ahead of time. What would it be like? What would I be like if I make this choice to secretly answer that text from somebody that Scott doesn't know about? To visit that Facebook page that I can't tell Scott about? It's giving me a pattern of forethought, of advanced planning, so that I will stay away from that. Because I don't want to pay the price that will be inevitable, that would come to me, the things that I don't think about. So it keeps me here mm -hmm. and focused into this mm -hmm. relationship. Having that exercise of thinking about what are those unintended consequences and who is going to pay that price. The, the answers are interesting to me. Children, for sure. People in your workplace. People at your church. Somebody always gets the friends. Mm -hmm. The friend group doesn't stay together, and somebody usually always gets the church. I mean, that you, mm -hmm. there's usually works that way. But people don't think in those terms. But those people are going about their lives. They're not talking about you. They're not asking, but they're going to be affected by the decisions that you make. So we're looking this weekend guys of this whole idea of how we're better together so we've looked at how we testify together we testify to the grace and goodness of God T together we open our hearts and minds to God's purposes for our marriage and then together we grow to be more like Christ in your booklets we've got a passage there I want us all to read it together it's 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 let's read that out loud together but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Say it with me one more time. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Marriage is the crucible, guys, for the Christ life. Marriage is the crucible for the Christ life. Now, some of you might say, well, what, Scott, is a crucible? A crucible is simply a situation of severe trial. It's a situation of severe trial in which different elements interact, leading to the creation of something new. A crucible is a situation of severe trial in which different elements interact, leading to the creation of something new. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. Has your marriage been through a severe trial recently? Do you ever feel you and your spouse couldn't be any more different? Could it be that God wants to take the two of you and make something new? A crucible is a situation of severe trial. Many of our marriages in here have been through severe trials. And I don't say this to scare you, but some in here are about to go through a severe trial. In which different elements interact. The things that drew Dawn and I together. When she was strutting across the mall going to Hallmark. I don't really you, think I walk like that. I know, that. but it just uh, I, if I walk like me, it just looks too manly. So I have to put a little feminine well, kind of booty action to it. I don't think I walk like that. Well, okay. Well, y'all get to <laughs> just put a feminine booty shaking walking down, and that's what she looked like. Yeah. But here's the thing, guys. In 1987, that, that, that confidence, that air about her that she had by 1989, 1990, that confident air became to me stubborn bullheadedness. The beauty that she exuded, she's, Dawn is a beautiful, you can look at her, I'll put her up against anybody in here. And um, 
I probably shouldn't have said that. No, you shouldn't. Yeah, have but, that. but I still will. Well, I'll put you up against sweet. anybody well, in that's here. That's very kind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you think that. Yeah, I do think <laughs> that. But here's the thing her beauty later on to me became like vanity. The thing often that draws us most to our spouse often can become the very thing that starts repelling us from our spouse. Think about it. Some of the characteristics, he is so funny, he is so jovial, or he is so laid back. Those things that drew you to him, I guarantee you, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I guarantee you are some of the very things that irritate you the most about him now. And vice versa. She is so shy. I loved it that she was so shy. She was so, but now it's like she just feels so antisocial. It's like we don't do anything. You don't want to see anybody. But you liked it. You liked it at one time. It attracted you to her. You see, God has this way of bringing two different elements together. And through severe trial, as we described earlier, to bring about something new. So I want to encourage you in this section of growing to be more like Christ. If you're going through severe trial right now, if you're thinking in your heart of hearts, you've maybe told your buddies or you've told your girlfriends, we couldn't be more different. We have nothing in common anymore. You are in a great place for a work of God. Mm -hmm. Because it's highly likely that God brought these two different personalities from different families of origins, often from different worldviews or varying value systems, different outlooks, different ways to resolve conflict, different ways to communicate, different ways to spend or save money. All of these differences, God has a way of bringing together to create something new. So we just want to encourage you this weekend, if you're tempted to repel from your spouse, push them away, could we encourage you this weekend to spend more time leaning in and begin asking the Father, Lord, what do you want to teach me in this relationship? Here's where I think for me um, um, is a great growth point, a place to start. When we, all the love's been squashed out of the Smith household, right? One thing that has helped me, continues to help me, uh, love to grow again between the two of us, is this understanding that before Scott is my husband, he is God's child. Mm -hmm. he, he is beloved of God. That's right. And even if hey, I... Hey. I'm beloved of God. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I know. You think you're the favorite. I, 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 I'm the favorite. I, I really do. I think me and <laughs> God, we're just kind of like know this. You, you know, yeah, I, just want right. you, I just want you to know that. Yeah. You've been telling yourself you're the favorite <laughs> for way too long. And he's been telling me that. I know too. that, yeah. but I'm yeah. favorite her. So it helps me, and he reminds me that he is a child of God, much beloved, that God paid a very high price for him. And I'm telling you, even now, that when I'm mad at Scott, and we still have times when we have breakdown in the Smith house, that it helps me to get back on track if I will start there. Because here's the thing, is that even in our worst times, Scott and I were both believers when we came into marriage. Mm -hmm. We think, we believe, that all of the one another's of Scripture become the foundation of mm -hmm. how we live and treat each other first. And then the marriage scriptures rest on top of those. We think that if you will practice the one another's of scripture, make that the goal, begin to do that. You can do that tomorrow. You can pull up the one another's of scripture and start to press into those even tomorrow. Then it will make you more likely to be successful when you start to enter into those big challenging scriptures of the, about marriage, about loving husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church man that that is a that is a high bar and wives see to it that you respect your husbands 
And that submission word, okay, well, let's just say that's a, that's a big hard one as well. But if we embrace the fact, first of all, we are believers. Mm -hmm. The scriptures are full of ways that we can treat each other. Then we are more likely to be successful. And when we do that, we put our roots down in truth. Scott and I were putting our roots down in lies mm -hmm. about each other. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not compatible. We're too different. Um, I hate him. She hates me. We, we're miserable now. We'll be miserable tomorrow. We're going to be miserable the rest of our lives. We were putting down roots in that thought life, okay? Instead of putting down roots in what is true. And that very first truth is that God paid a very high price for this person. Mm -hmm. And actually, God's opinion trumps mine. Mm -hmm. And I might ought to be real careful how I speak and act with this one who has been treasured by a most high God. That is a great place to start growing. you got to figure out where you're going to put your roots down. You make that decision today. Yeah. You're going to put them down in truth, or are you going to put them down in lies? Yeah. So when Dawn talks about the one another's, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. They're replete throughout the New Testament, probably over 50-something, except one another. We're going to look at it in the next in the next section, accept one another, bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2, care for one another, comfort one another. We're going to talk about that later on this weekend. Uh, be devoted to one another, Romans 12, 10. Uh, forgive one another, Ephesians 4, 32, we're going to look at here in just a moment. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Hey, let's just do that. Let's just practice that one another. If, if this is, make sure it's your spouse. Don't reach and right. kiss the wrong person. But just greet your spouse with a holy kiss. There you go. It's greet one another with a holy kiss. There you go. There you go. Practice hospitality with one another, Peter says. It's all throughout the, the New Testament, these one another's. Don says it like this, and it's, it's a great principle for us to realize. Each morning, Dawn is the first believer that I wake up to and spend the day with. The very first person I get to choose whether I am or am not going to be like Christ. Your spouse is the very first person more often than unless some of you have your children sleeping between you. Maybe your kid right there beside you. Uh, that's a whole different. You might talk about that with who's Trent. That's Trent and Marianna doing yes, parenting, we, right? Yeah, go see let's, them. let's tackle that issue, yes. Trent and Marianne. Uh, but your spouse is the first person that you get to choose. It is your choice. Am I going to be like Christ? Don't say, no, it's not, Scott. It, if you knew what he was like, you would know what. No. Because Christ put it this way. Paul speaks of it this way in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were what? We were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the choice to be as Christ is with us. Mm -hmm. It's not, well, she, she has to earn it or deserve it. No, no, no. You didn't get God's love for you after you earned it or deserved it. He gave it to you when you were still like a jerk. Some of you in here probably still are jerks, and he still loves you. Right? That is the Christ life. That is the life that God is calling us through marriage to, to grow like. He is using my and dolls. Listen, we struggle with this on a daily basis. 30 years into this does not mean all these issues go away. Right. We still deal with the very issues that many of you are dealing with in the early years of marriage. The beauty is we have grown in Christ, and the margin and the space between dealing with those issues has increased. And it can be true for you as well. So don't be pushed away from your spouse. Don't think that there's a bigger, better deal somewhere else. That's just a lie that you're rooting yourself in. And I can promise you that bigger, better deal, more often than not, after the person has bought into the bigger, better deal, usually within a two- to three-year window, they're back in our office trying to get rid of the bigger, better deal. Yeah. We've learned more often than not I don't care if this is your first marriage. I don't care if this is your second marriage, your third or your fourth. This is what I believe God would say to you. Make sure it's your last. 
Statistics have proven generally within a five to seven year window. This is not even in Jesus culture. This is in the statistical relational culture. Statistics have proven when people are facing severe trials and hardships in marriage, if they will just press in and work through their issues, generally speaking, there tends to be a breakthrough. And this is not Joel Osteen. This is secular culture. There tends to be a breakthrough within five to seven years if they stay the course. I guarantee you there's a couple, we've got about, what, 120-something couples in here. I guarantee you there's a couple that is here this weekend in a room this size that he or she and or both of them are on the precipice of walking out. And let me just plead with you. We've already talked at your tables about the unintended consequences. But let me say this to you. You might be walking away when you're right there on the precipice of a breakthrough. I wish I could tell you how many couples, some of our college friends, have come to us and saying and have said, I regret our divorce. If we had just stayed in at Scott and Dawn, we would have made it. And I look back 10, 15, 20 years later, and I regret that decision. Don't make a decision right now, especially emotionally. This is what Dawn and I learned from our own experience. Sometimes when we're experiencing pain, we just want relief. We're seeking relief. I would encourage you, rather than seek relief, seek God. I can promise you, we are proof positive that what we're talking about is not theoretical. It's not philosophical. It's theological. It's experiential. We have seen it happen in our own life. So we're not selling you a bill of goods. We're telling you what we have experienced ourselves. I guarantee you, not many, don't raise your hand, please. You could just tell me privately. Not many people in here have prayed yet for their spouse to die. I feel pretty safe. There's probably usually in a room this size one or two guys that will come to me throughout the weekend and say, hey, that was me. But just don't raise your hand now. But the point is this. You're not that desperate. We were terrible. So you have hope. You've not gotten to the point that we are or were. So stay the course. God's with you. It's in these relationships we grow to be more like Christ. And then the final point for this session we extend the same acceptance and forgiveness that God in Christ extended to us. We extend the same acceptance and forgiveness that God in Christ extended to us. Look at your spouse and say this, I accept you. Look at them, look at them, look them in the eye and say this, I accept you. I accept you. Now listen to me. Look back at me. I know there's some in this room right now, you don't feel that. You don't feel like you accept them. You're probably thinking, Scott and Dawn, if you knew what I knew about him or what I knew about her, you wouldn't be saying I accept you either. But what we're told in Scripture here is to extend the same and acceptance to our spouses that was extended to us. Let's read together here Romans 15, 7. Let's read it out loud together. Wherefore, Therefore, accept one, one another just as Christ, Christ all accepted us to the, the glory, glory of God. God. Let's read it one more time. Wherefore, Therefore, accept one, one another just as Christ also accepted us to, to the, the glory, glory of, God. of God. You see what the acceptance is. I'm not saying your acceptance of your spouse is condoning their behavior. I'm not saying that at all. Christ, God through Christ accepted us, not condoning our sinful behavior. He loved us. He gave grace and acceptance. He loved us where we were, but loved us enough not to leave us where we were. Does that make sense? And so your acceptance of your spouse is, is really just conveying to them what God in Christ has done for you. Now, here might be a prayer that you want to pray if you're struggling, if you're in a severe trial. Lord, help me. I want to want to. I don't accept him or I don't accept her right now. Right now, I'm more repulsed by him or her than I am accepting of him and her. 
If that's where you are, and I hope it's not, but if that's where you are, pray, God, help my want to to want to. I know you accepted me. I see it here on the page. I know it to be true. I have experienced it to be true. Now, let me say this parenthetically. If you have never experienced the grace, acceptance, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, tonight, this weekend, is no better time to do it. We have plenty of people here of which I am talking about would love Stephen, Dawn, Misty, any of us that have been on the platform, any of our leaders here, if you don't know what we're talking about when we're talking about these one another's and grace and acceptance, as all of this just feels like church words, we would love to talk to you privately to explain what we personally have experienced through Jesus Christ. Together we extend the same acceptance and forgiveness that God in Christ extended to us. Let's read Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Here's what I have found often in relationships. When we're sitting in our office and, and a couple, either one or both of them, are bitter and resentful towards one another. What I often find, and I've even seen it in my own life, is this. People who tend to not have an ability to forgive or to be full of grace tend to be people who don't realize how much they themselves have been forgiven and how much grace has been extended to them. It's kind of the adage, those who have Uh, experience little love, love little, it's the same thing. So chances are, if you have a bitter, resentful, unforgiving heart towards your spouse, or maybe somebody else, not even in this room, but a family member, let me encourage you just to ponder, Lord, help me see how much you have accepted, have graced me, have forgiven me. Help me to see that. I tell you what. In the early years, and we'll talk about it here in just a moment. Well, yeah, I'm not going to get there yet. We'll get there in a minute. So let me just ask you this. Do you want to create a greater level of intimacy between you and your spouse? Would you say yes? Do uh, Yes. And I'm not talking just sexual. I'm not even talking sexual, really. Here's what Dawn and I have found. When you get these principles that we're going to teach you this weekend, that you're going to hear in your breakout, and you actually start applying these principles to your life, I can guarantee you, I can't give you a time frame. People always want a quick fix. Here's what I have found in the kingdom of God. I have seen people healed instantaneously from addictive behaviors. I have seen people healed instantaneously from physical ailments. I've seen it in my office instantaneously. One thing Dawn and I have yet to experience in working with over hundreds of couples is instantaneous relational healing. Relational healing, for some reason, even in the kingdom of God, tends to take time. It's almost like being in debt. You don't go into debt overnight, and you don't get out of debt overnight. You don't go into bad places, digging bad roots, as Dawn was saying earlier, and get out of those overnight. It takes time. But here's what I want to encourage you. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. It really is. If you just leave this weekend thinking, we're going to begin just to measure progress and not perfection. We're going to measure progress, not perfection. If you look in your Bibles in Philippians 1.6, Paul says it this way, but I am confident of this very thing, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will complete it. He will perfect it. He will mature it. For those of us who are believers in him, he will mature it until the day that Christ returns for us. What that says to me is this. Every one of us in this room who are believers in Jesus Christ are works in progress. Right? We're not perfected. We are in the process of being perfected. We are works in progress. So let's celebrate our progress. Hey, I want to just take a... This is just a... 
not in your notes. I want you to look with your spouse. And I just want you for just a minute or two to do this. Let's celebrate what is working. Now, some of you here might say, Scott, nothing is working. That's why we're here. No. I tell people, I told a couple yesterday in my office, a broken clock is right twice a day. So even though you think it is broken and nothing is working, something is working. You may have great children that you had nothing to do with. Here's what I've observed. Some of the worst parents have their best children. So don't take credit. And if you have bad children and you're a great parent, don't take the blame. But let's celebrate for just a minute or two what is working. Just say, this is working. I'm thankful for this, honey. I'm thankful for this. Celebrate for just a minute, we, and we'll come back. Go. We got, we got to stop y'all. Some of y'all are getting the juices flowing too soon. And you've got, we've still got a date night. And you, we've got a couple. You can't leave here till 11. So we don't want to get the, the motor running too soon. All right, good. <laughs> Celebration. Cele there you go. All right, there we go. So I asked the question, do you want to create greater intimacy between you and your spouse? Then grow in the grace of acceptance and forgiveness of your spouse. I can say this. I can say this. Listen to me. Nothing will heighten the intimacy between you and your spouse than unconditional love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace. I can promise you that. Let me tell you the adverse of the converse of that. The converse is this. As Dawn was saying earlier, in the early, early 90s, when things, the wheels started coming off of our relational bus, I was... I was very judgmental. I was very critical. I had a self-righteous attitude. Here's why. As Dawn alluded to, I, I read my Bible daily. I spent time with, the God, with God daily. I listened to Him. And I prayed for my wife. I was really just like, as you read through the New Testament, I was just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. My prayers, I didn't verbally say it, but this was largely my attitude. Thank you, Lord, that I am like me. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done in me. Lord, I see so much of you in me. Please help Dawn be more like me and you. Mm -hmm. That was largely my prayer. I never prayed that, but 20 years later in reflecting on it, that was exactly how I was praying. I was a jerk. But nobody, nobody knew it. Because when I was leading worship on Sunday morning, it all looked fine and good. We, I was the plastic fruit. But there was incongruency. My public face did not match the face that Dawn experienced at home. And you want to talk about creating tension? There was even tension going on in her life between not only me and her, but between her and God. Because I was standing here as an emissary of God. And if that's what God's like, I don't want any part of it was largely what she was feeling. This week, uh, I've been making a poor attempt, but an attempt nonetheless, to clean my office up a little bit. <laughs> It's been poor. It yeah, has been yeah. poor because you know it's bad when you left the door open when you left, but when you come back, somebody had shut the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that means don't look in Dawn's office. It's a terrible mess. So I was going through some Bible studies maybe that I had, had taught in the past, and I pulled out a home builder's study from probably, I don't know, Gosh, 1992 1990. or something mm -hmm. like 93. 
It was the first small group Bible study Scott and I taught together on marriage. This was after God really had done some amazing work in our heart. And out of an overflow of all of that, we got asked to lead a little marriage study. So I pulled that Bible study out, and I found this letter that at 24 years old, I wrote. Marianna and I were talking earlier that we, we do better when we write things out. And apparently I wrote some things. I had written this letter to God. Dear God, I feel as though I have so much to say if only someone would listen. Yet when the time comes to say those things, I have no words to share. For my life to be so full right now, on the inside, I am so empty. I feel as though I'm very alone while living among many. My only real bright spot is my lovely Hannah. I love her with everything in me, but that love is draining me dry. There is no one who loves me back. Scott is always gone. He has his own other life he lives, and I am not included in that life. I'm just not close enough to anyone to share my truest feelings with, and even if I did, who would accept me? Many times I've thought of running off, but I fear your punishment for leaving my marriage, and so I stay. I don't really know what I want anymore. At one time, everything seemed easy. Why is it that my life is crumbling now? You've protected me all of my life, and why do I feel so unprotected now? I can't even envision my own life in five years, and I'm afraid. I don't have anything to look forward to. Scott and I will always be poor. I'll never have a house of my own. Scott will never find me worthy of a nice gift. My love language is gifts. This was even before I even knew that. I will always be trapped. I'm sorry that Hannah will be trapped too. Her daddy will never love her. She'll always be second best, as I will be. I just want to know, God, why have you chosen this way for me? Lord, I'm fearful of even telling you this because I'm afraid that you'll take Hannah from me. And I can't bear that. I have such incredible love for her, and she keeps me hanging on. If it wasn't for her, I would have left a long time ago. Sometimes I'm not sure that even that can keep me here. Lord, you know my heart of hearts, and you have control of everything, and I'm asking you to fix me. Something has to be wrong with me. Do I not have the faith necessary to be what you want me to be? It seems as though daily I fail to hit the mark. I can't seem to get organized, and when I do, I can't seem to stay that way. I'm not worthy of titles mother, wife, or spiritual woman. I never feel like a woman, period. I still feel like a nobody, just existing from day to day. Days turn into months and those to years. Sometimes I wish I could just lead a different life, wild and adventurous and romantic, just to see what it would be like, and then return to my present life if I didn't like it, without hurting anyone and without fearing your punishment or leaving. And so most of my day, I live in a fantasy world, living out that other life in my imagination. I need your help to sort out my feelings, to make me complete, because I have never felt so alone, unloved, empty, incomplete, unfulfilled, unworthy, and desolate as I do now. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person who's felt this way or who feels that way in this room tonight. These were the unintended consequences mm -hmm. of our sin, yeah. both of us. Scott's ivory tower, high mightiness, my brokenness from my past. Brian mentioned carrying guilt. I can't tell you how much guilt plagued me, and I tried to build a healthy life on it. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Scott, you can talk about Philippians mm -hmm. chapter 2 because yeah. that is where life began to change for us. Yeah, during this time of my critical spirit, judgmental attitude, self-righteous piousness, I, as I said, I continued to read my Bible on a daily basis. And at this time, I came across a passage in Philippians. If you've, bought, if you've got your Bibles or your phone, you can turn with me to it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It's not in your notes, I don't believe. 
But Paul was talking there really about unity within the church. This verse, and that's why we say a lot of times we're teaching people just to do the Christ life. We're not even teaching them how to do marriage. Because if you could do the Christ life, the marriage life actually comes a lot easier. But I was reading there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, and it says this. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. And in that moment in time, it's like I had just this epiphany, this my mind opened up. It's as if the kingdom of God came down into my world. I did not hear an audible voice from God, but this is what I heard in my spirit was God basically said, Scott, you're not all that. You have some selfish, self-righteous, arrogant, brash, prideful tendencies that you need to repent of. You need to repent of those and you need to begin regarding your wife as more important than yourself. Because basically, Scott, and I didn't hear this is what I was hearing internally. It was not this audible voice. But the father was basically saying this to me. Scott, you live your life like this. I want what I want, when I want it, no questions asked. I want to go play softball with the guys when they want me to go play softball, regardless of what you want and need from me. I want to lead at the church when I want to lead, when the church asks me. If they ask me, it must be of God because they're asking me, so I'm going to do it. And I never gave consideration to Dawn about what I was saying yes to. Don largely felt as though in this period that I was a married man who was still living a single life because my life virtually didn't change in terms of priorities. But God started softening my heart. And this really, guys, began the transformation of our marriage. Yes. God started softening me. My heart that was once hardened and calloused became soft. Mm -hmm. I started having compassion. I started having love and grace and unconditional acceptance of this woman who had done nothing in, in my view to change. God was changing me. Yes. Here's Let me just thing. say this to you. Go um, ahead. A lot of times what we're wanting in marriage is for our spouse to change. And listen, I'm not negating. There's probably some reality that there needs to be change there. But God has never given you and or me the right of spouse control. For those in here who are believers, we have been encompassed with the fruit of the Spirit that's called self-control. And that's all God has ever given us the right and responsibility to control. I had to release control of my wife and begin to let the Holy Spirit of God within me control me. But here's a byproduct of it. When Dawn perceptively started seeing that I was giving her unconditional love and acceptance, she began to flower into this woman I had always longed and hoped for. Largely because I moved out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do a work in her life. Mm -hmm. We cannot truly practice acceptance and forgiveness until we have embraced the humiliation of the fact of how much it took for us to be accepted and forgiven by Christ. We, we cannot do it until we have humbled ourselves with that knowledge. We can read it. We read these verses, and we can uh, intellectually um, assent to it. We can understand it, yes. But we, if we don't allow ourselves to be humbled by the price that was paid for us to be accepted, to be forgiven, we cannot do it with our spouse. It'll always be conditional. It'll always be conditional. When that happened for us, growth truly began to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, change began to happen. It was as if God was speaking into Scott's life and into his heart. Son, grow up. <laughs> and he wasn't saying it in a snarky way, like we say to people when we're annoyed with them. 
you need to grow up. He's not. He said, son, it's time to grow up. Even a little is going to make a big difference. It's mm -hmm. time to grow up. Yeah. And he was saying into me, Dawn, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. He was inviting us into this relationship to be restored, to be renewed, to put our roots down in some truths, mm -hmm. to finally have some real growth, and to get rid of the plastic fruit so that we might have this fruitfulness that was designed for us to experience and produce all along. So as we close our session tonight, we're about to go into our date night in just a few moments. This, this is how we're going to stop our time together around the table for just a few moments, for about a couple of minutes. I want you to answer this question with one another and share as you're comfortable sharing. I don't want you, in, no one in here is pressed to share if you don't want to share. That's okay. We're wanting you to learn and experience what community, what we call here, doing life together is like. So I want you to answer this question. How is marriage challenging you to grow up? How is marriage challenging you, not your spouse, how is marriage challenging you to grow up? And let me just say this. Answer in a way that's not throwing your spouse under the bus. Okay? You got me on that one? So let's go. Talk for just a few moments, then we'll come back and close it up.